welcome to The Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. This is Ian from the future. To explain what you're about to hear, Mike and I had a special treat when we recorded this week's episode in an Airbnb in Miami, which is where we were both together for a business meeting. We were super excited to be working face-to-face together for once. We had this little side room. We prepared it for audio recording. We had duvets and towels on the floor and the door and the walls and worked really hard with the setup only to discover that between the way we set up our mics and the way we set up our software, we'd still managed to record audio that was of much poorer quality than you're normally used to on the lover's hole. So we apologize in advance for the audio quality this week. We hope anyway that the idea of Ian and Mike in the same room together is at least a little compensation. Normal service is going to be resumed next week. Anyhow, on with the show. You're with Ian and with Mike. And together, we are rereading our favourite series of novels, the Aubrey Metro novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, before we get into exactly where we are in the world, let's talk about where we are in the novels. Where were we last week? Could you help us anticipate where we're going oh, this week? I would be delighted. Thanks, Ian. Sure. So last time in Chapter 6, Jack took the Franklin and detoured a board to go privateering, while Tom took Stephen at the surprise into port to sell the prizes and get the surprise refitted. Stephen found a ship to take Martin home with a surgeon to treat him. And Stephen and Sam Panda reunited and started to discuss abolition and independence. This time, chapter seven, the girls go to church. Stephen continues his mission ashore. Dutour goes missing. And Jack takes on a big wind in a small boat. We'll talk about earthquakes, the Inquisition, Incas, and the changing situation in Peru. Great. And Mike, let's talk about where we are as well. If we sound a little bit different, it's because something special is happening this week. The lovers are together. Um, Mike and I are sitting across the table from each other in in a rented property in the suburbs of Miami. It's a long story for how we got here, but we... (laughs) Here we are. So we hope you're enjoying. We're, we're loving being together. We hope you're enjoying hearing us in what might be a more natural style than normal. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know if we can cope with eye contact and everything. Right. At the same time. Ah. So, Mike, the chapter opens with this series of little vignettes ashore with Stephen, with a bunch of different character setups here. He starts out um, with the girls. They've gone ashore, and Stephen... And Sam Panda and Sarah and Emily are walking to Sam's house immediately after the girls' first pontifical high mass. This is a big deal for girls who've been raised Catholics. And they've never been in a church before, so they are all struck by the organ. They got the blessing of the archbishop. Sam had shown them this fountain, the splendid fountain of the world in the Lima Square, surrounded, as we're told, by 24 artillery pieces and 16 iron chains of unusual weight. And the Casa de la Inquisición, the House of the Inquisition, rivaled only by the one in Madrid. And also they had seen the two streets surrounding it, which had once, we're told, been paved in silver ingots to welcome an earlier Spanish viceroy. And Mike, this is immediately that the the world ashore has kind of become fantastical. It's fantastical in the eyes of the girls. And um, we also get another little insight into the um, the physical environment that they're in. Sam explains to them that because of earthquakes, the upper and lower floors of the house are often made of wood and are decorated to look like stone or brick, uh, like the rest of the building. So he, he's telling them how it's important to keep the door open in the event of an earthquake so that it doesn't jam and trap you inside. And I might there are some interesting things going on here. We're being introduced already to some things that I think are important in the chapter. Well, it is really neat. Ian. You know, we've got uh, you know these are themes that we've you know we've touched upon already in the book, but here we've got the Inquisition. And, you know, this is going to loom larger, and we've already been talking about religious, national differences, tribal prejudices, with all these sectarian differences aboard the surprise, as well as where people are from and some of that. Um, 
we get this earthquake metaphor right on the heels of this description of religious and military might, these statues, these artillery pieces, these heavy chains, and advice to keep the door open in the ground floor in case you need to get out as well. And, you know, perhaps even a little reference that life can be a bit precarious when you're on the top or on the bottom. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. But interestingly, I, I kind of thought, you know, is, is O'Brien making this up, this whole wooden top floor, bottom floor and everything? And absolutely, wood, building and earthquake zones. And as recently as May 2022 in the journal, the research journal of modernization, engineering, technology and science, there's a great article listing all the superiority of wood in earthquake resistant zones, oh. you know, their benefits over steel, over brick and over reinforced concrete. So oh. yeah, the Peruvians had it right here. And I'm really curious about the, the, the introduction of the Inquisition here. We've, we've heard it mentioned before, and I was really not as, you know, echoing the, the, the distrust and the division and the sectarian and political divides about the surprise and the Franklin. But uh, yeah, we're seeing it ashore here as well, as we mentioned the Inquisition. I have a feeling that we're going to go deeper, as you say, into religious and national prejudice. Uh, you might even go so far as to say... Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! <laughs> so, it's high time we had a Monty Python reference. So we've, we've found one there. There you go. Now, we're in the situation where Stephen and the girls are having dinner with Sam, and we get this nice comparison of Sam's servant, Ippolito, who has this kind of ludicrous resemblance to Killick. And let's just remind ourselves, like father, like son, the same look, says the text, of pinched, shrewish discontent, diffused indignation, the same put upon air, the same restless desire to have everything proceed according to his own idea of order, which is <laughs> great characterization. <laughs> And the girls, to begin with, have got excellent manners and they're really beautifully dressed and they're very prim and very proper, but that starts to disappear when they drink wine and their glasses are going down um, just uh, you know, at the same pace as the other diners. They break into fits of laughter when Ippolito's serving boy starts making what, what he calls antique gestures at them from the kitchen and they are sent out to play, sent out to play and to wait for Jemmy Ducks. Stephen's very apologetic. He says he would have had them whipped. <laughs> but Sam says, oh, it's good for healthy children to laugh from time to time. Sure, he says, it would be a dismal existence otherwise. And Mike, I, I was really enjoying the similarities. I mean, O'Brien is directing us towards the similarity between this guy, Ippolito, and Killick. Um, we get, in some ways, in this little moment here, Sam is like his father, Jack, including this very passionate character, even being not averse to violence in, you know, in support of a cause and defeating slavery. And maybe, as we're about to find out here, there are some ways in which Sam is actually like Stephen Maturin. So th this is what we pick up here. As Sam describes to Stephen how there's a reasonably strong feeling for independence, for the, the, this feeling that the present viceroy of Peru is making decisions in favor of those born in Spain rather than of those born in Peru. And that's mm -hmm. a reason for people to be discontented. Some people combine this with the desire to end slavery not as many as the independence seekers in Chile, since slavery is very important to the to the economy in Peru, to the plantation economy. And Sam goes on and describes how there are many highly respected, influential men who hate slavery, such as Sam's two friends and his colleague, Father O'Higgins, the vicar general. Uh, Sam's boss, Father Inigo Gomez, a descendant of one of the great Inca families uh, who lectures on Indian languages at the university. And Sam says, there are still many Indians even after the last desperate rising, who are interested in this cause here. And, and maybe this last desperate rising is a mention as well to what might be at the back of Stephen's mind, the, uh, the Irish uprising of 1798. And, and right away, like, like with this very Stephen-like uh, maneuvering that he's got going, he's, he's offering to introduce Stephen to these people, O'Higgins and Gomez and the others. And, uh, yeah, Sam's going to be an ally in more ways than we might have expected. Yeah, and, and I love Stephen here. Stephen's watch goes off and he goes, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be late to my next appointment. And he pauses to warn Sam. You know, he sees Sam opening up with his yeah. invitation. And he says, you know, that he, Stephen, is bitterly opposed to slavery. And he's also bitterly opposed to, as he says, the dependence of any country at all upon another, any country at all. And therefore, 
He, Stephen, may be suspected of political or subversive motives by those in authority. He says he doesn't want to put Sam or Sam's friends in danger because, as Stephen says, the people who maintain the established order make the Inquisition look like mildness itself. So here's the Inquisition again, and somebody even harsher than the Inquisition here. And, you know, Stephen has had firsthand uh, experience with yeah. exactly that. Well, Sam tells Stephen not to trouble himself. <laughs> he notes how Stephen is a little bit more candid than the Frenchmen who were on the same mission, yeah. and, you know, yeah. Not, yeah. not owning up to any of it. And Stephen gets directions and leaves, you know, realizing that he's now late for his appointment. That appointment is with his local intelligence contact. And, and in conversing with him, Stephen realizes very quickly that this guy's a Catalan, just yeah. like Stephen, you know, he's half Catalan. And Gallungas, you know, he's, he's saying about, you know, he's so sorry that Stephen is so late. And Steve, you know, says, well, you know, I'm sorry I'm late too, but it's only 20 minutes. And guy <laughs> says, no, no, no. You know, I've had this money here for the mission waiting for you for more than 20 weeks. And he says, you know, and in that time, that more than 20 weeks, Peru's situation has changed radically for the worse, you know, in terms of independence and its propensity for it. And Chile's has gotten a lot better. So it's like, okay, you're going to come to Peru and Chile. Maybe, maybe we're better off in Chile. But Stephen explains about the long delay. You know, Spain had heard about the surprises mission. They, you know, gone aboard the Diane. They got sunk. They had months long trips trying to get here. But he says that Stephen is, you know, he's bound by his original instructions unless they want to send to England and wait another six months for new orders. Man, it's, and it, you know, it's that reminder of, you know, our world and our people and our, our behaviors are so alike. And the world is so different in so many ways, too. You know, and Guyung is, is, is saying, you know, you know, he's tried to inform the foreign office of this. He's tried to get new instructions, but they just blow them off. And Stephen says, yeah, you know, I've, I've had that kind of same experience with foreign office. And Guyung, who is a Marine insurer, says if the foreign office were a firm of Marine insurers, they would be bankrupt within a year. But he can still you know, proceed kind of along the original mission and arrange some free meetings for Stephen here. Yeah, there's a little I wonder if moment here because it, it, the story's become counterfactual. If we go back to the real timeline for Thomas Cochrane, the, the alter ego of, of, of Jack Aubrey, after Cochrane's trial for the stock exchange for all the way back in reverse of the medal, and after Cochrane exiting the Navy in disgrace, Cochrane undertook an initial mission to Latin America in the lines of a similar cause, but that was actually to Chile in 1818. So if Stephen and Jack had been able to take Gallegos' advice and switch focus away from Peru to Chile. Jack and Stephen would have gone on to Chile and would have been in the real world Cochrane story. But as it is, we're in this counterfactual. Uh, they're going to have to press on in Peru with this now slightly deteriorating situation and the consequences of all this delay. We're hoping that the changed political situation isn't going to cause further problems. And that makes us go, hmm, I wonder what's happening next here. Maybe everything's going to be okay because Stephen's got the money and he's Stephen, right? Yeah, maybe. Right, right. Well, Stephen, being the shrewd, smart, intelligent man that he is, and intelligent agent that he is, you know, says, well, well, tell me exactly how has the situation changed? And Guyangus explains that you know, two of their top supporters can no longer help them. There was one very popular general who would have carried at least half of the officers in the military with him that he died in a horse accident. So boom, big man, player off the board. And that the archbishop, who was very supportive, is now senile. So he's not you know, able to get things done. And finally, they had a man highly placed inside government. Munoz, and he's returned to Spain. His, you know, his term here was over. He went back, uh, and he's been replaced by this guy Garcia de Castro. And Castro is very upset. He says he's too timid to be corrupt. He's wholly unreliable. He's clever, but he's weak, and he's terrified of the viceroy and losing his place. So he, you know, he wants to hold on to this place in government. And Stevens now, where he's saying, whoa, 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 you know, Munoz has left. Uh, Bunyas kind of knew all about me and my mission here. What what papers has he left behind? And uh, Gayungas assures him that, you know, they've, you know, Bunyas before he left destroyed all his files and that even if there's some 
errant document laying around. Stephen was always referred to as Dominova, not Stephen Matron. Yeah. There was no mention of the surprise, no mention of Jack. And then, you know, they're sitting there. All of a sudden, the church bells are ringing all across the city. And mm-hmm. Stephen makes a fascinating observation. He says, except in certain forms, the church is not a well-organized body, scarcely an organized body at all. Yet sometimes flashes of sharp, coordinated intelligence pierce through, and they are the more formidable for being unexpected. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. (laughs) We had that a moment ago. Thank you, O'Brien and Monty Python. But there is perhaps a certain analogy here, Stephen continues, with that church and the Spanish government. So little ominous foreshadowing going, okay, these guys seem to be in disarray. They're not really good. But every once in a while, they can get you here. Now, Gaiangas you know, kind of picks up that lead from state and well, the new viceroy here and his people are not intelligent. But unfortunately, they're also completely unapproachable. They're active, zealous, and wholly committed to the Spanish king. However, Iungus, thankfully, still has some people in the secretariat who, you know, he's close to, they're close to him. They keep him supplied with all the latest reports coming into the palace and that he'll share information from those with Stephen. Uh, Gaiungus also has a close relationship with the trade and customs chief, since as a marine insurer, Gaiungus' job to be really well informed. He's got lots of sources of excellent information on, on the you know surrounding governments, shipping, cargoes, and the like. And he has cut this official in on some profitable ventures in exchange for more information, resulting in Gaiungus actually receiving a copy of every confidential report coming to the viceroy from throughout Peru. Uh, so by you know using those, he now knows the loyalties, at least reported to the viceroy here, of all the military officers, the church officers, and the government officials. Boy, this is a mother load. Oh, this, this sounds like he's, he's set, right? He's got all of the information and the access and the resources and the connections that he needs to do this. You know, insurrection, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, and right. And the reader was thinking, okay, this isn't, we've had good news for too long here. So uh, maybe it's time for some complications to arise. Yeah. And one of those is that, you know, the French mission. You know, Gaianga said, you know, let me inform you about these, you know, the French that have come here, you know, really on the same thing, trying to get Peruvians uh, who were for independence to side with France. And he says, there are two mathematicians measuring the force of gravity, the height of mountains. There's two naturalists, sort of like Stephen there, and then there's a fifth who speaks good Spanish and seems to only be involved in arranging their expeditions. Um, they all are reported to be men of great learning. They had an introduction letter said to be from Humboldt, and they haven't made very much progress with those in favor of independence, particularly uh, given the, the current French position on slavery. So we know some of the people who are for independence are not for slavery. And they lack enough money to tempt the people who are worth tempting, you know, who, you know, who could be tempted and are worth tempting. However, despite everything, you know, kind of sums up, France still has kind of a glamour to it. And the name of Napoleon, you know, makes some young people in favor of independence kind of giddy with enthusiasm. And then the two naturalists, just by their naturalist bona fides, have many followers, including Castro. We had talked about, you know, this guy who is now in Munoz's old position here. You know, he sees them often. He's invited them to stay up in the high Andes. They describe this part of place in the high Andes where, where Humboldt was. You know, you can touch the moon from the ground floor here. You know, that gets Stephen into a reverie. He's yeah. like, oh my gosh, how badly he wants to see the high Andes and its wildlife and its plants. And Gayunga says that, you know, the journey is there for him. He's made it before, is so difficult. He'd rather be taken by the Inquisition. Oh my gosh. Well, th- this is interesting though, and, and a bit worrying as we hear about the situation for these French officials here. Stephen, it turns out, isn't the only one who can get around by speaking the local language, by befriending naturalists and explorers. That's what his normal jam is. And the French are across that already. Jack Aubrey isn't the only one who can claim connection to Humboldt and the sciences of astronomy and geophysics. The French are across that too. The French in Peru are a model for Jack and Stephen. 
and I'm sure that's not going to work well. Well, and that reminds me that Castro is a Murano. His great grandmother was a Jewess in Toledo. And, and that's, you know, Daniel says that's why he longs to be so cherished by the Viceroy, while also ensuring that, you know, he's kind of got friends on the other side, on the independent side. He's, he's kind of trying to make sure he assures a place for himself. And Stephen notes that a Murano cannot afford to make enemies, that people can, you know, because of that lineage and that history, people can easily accuse him of Hebrew practices. You know, they can drag him uh, in front of the Inquisition because Hebrew practices are something they don't take lightly. So Stephen concludes that Castro, you know, would be well served just to remain quiet. And Dayunga says that Castro is incapable of remaining quiet. Now, Ian, these Moranos, tell me, this is this is a real thing, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a, so Morano is a word that describes Spanish and Portuguese Jews living in the Iberian Peninsula at this time who had converted from Judaism or had been for, forcibly and ostensibly converted to Christianity back during the Middle Ages, as long ago as that, but continued to practice their Judaism in secrecy. So a Morano is somebody who is outwardly and officially a Catholic, but is privately uh, practicing the Jewish faith. And these days, the name Morano in some quarters could be taken as offensive, even as an anti-Semitic slur. Maybe that's because in 2023... Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! Yeah, Monty Python have got it right. Now, what started out as a really like welcoming and complete picture of the political landscape in Peru is now starting to sound like it's got some jeopardy for Stephen, even some jeopardy for Jack. And Gaiongas takes us deeper and deeper into all the uncertainties and the dramas here. He says that lots of the captains and the lieutenants in the armed forces of Peru are idealistic and support independence, while the senior officers are mostly concerned with power and personal advantage, and they tend to hate one another. And I don't think that's an entirely unfamiliar situation for Stephen. Gaiongo says he does know three disinterested generals who, if approached properly, might move together and precipitate a revolution, especially if they have donations that allow them to win the support of five or six key regiments in key positions. And Gaiongo says that with, with all the funds that Stephen has, he can well afford to do this. The one bit of good news here is that the French cannot, like for, yeah, for all their relationships and their connections, they don't have the cash. We learn that General Hurtado is the most influential and Gaiongos is going to arrange for Stephen to go shooting with him on the Friday morning. Now, yeah, this, this sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a few Patrick O'Brien tropes here. We've, we've encountered generals from the Iberian Peninsula who are vain and like to talk a lot. Like we remember Stephen's uncle, Ramon de la Strette, on Grimm's Home Island back in what Surgeon's Mate. We've had dignitaries who insist on going hunting before they talk to any of our heroes. Like we had the, the bays back in the Ionian mission, and we had the Sultan in 13 Gun Salute. And I, I don't know if O'Brien is just reaching for these because they're handy things to put in the storyline or if they're you know, symbols and tokens or something that are important. So you know, maybe let us know what you think. Stephen is pressing on here. Um, he asks Gaiongos if he could borrow these confidential reports that all come across Gaiongos' desk. And yes, he says you can read them here. Gaiongos is happy to offer to research and brief Stephen on these different personalities. And Stephen, in turn, asks about one personality in particular, he asks about Sanam and those church officials that Sam had mentioned. And Gaiongo says, well, with the failing archbishop, the vicar general, this guy O'Higgins, is the most important man in the diocese. And interestingly, this is one name that connects to the real world Cochrane-led uh, insurrection in South America. There was another O'Higgins, Jaime O'Higgins, who was uh, a big figure in the revolution in Chile. But here we've got the, uh, the brother of this real world character. The vicar general, he says, is an abolitionist, would be on their side, except for the fact that he doesn't like violence. And the English are, for the most part, heretics, meaning Protestants. Father Panda is described by Agarongos as being uh, the vicar general's assistant, doesn't seem to mind violence as much, is an abolitionist himself, and likely to be made a high church official soon. And the vicar general thinks the world of Sam. Father Gomez, meanwhile, is descended from this great Inca figure from uh, Pachacuti Inca. I've no idea if that's the right way to say it, but that was the first great Inca conqueror who unified the Inca people from southern Peru to Ecuador back in the 13th century. The Indians revere this guy. He's very learned. 
And Stephen says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'd like to meet with the general on Friday, then go see the vicar general, O'Higgins, and then talk to the other two, including Father Gomez, once he knows the vicar general's views. So Stephen's, you know, despite all these uncertainties, he's lining up his positions here. And uh, I, I have a strong sense that, meanwhile, in the back of his mind, as you said, Mike, Stephen's really tempted by this idea of a trip. Gyongus then drops a real plum in Stephen's lap here. He says, I have messengers. They're going to Panama by way of the High Andes, the, this territory that Stephen wants to visit. Gyongus can arrange for them, first of all, to carry any mail that Stephen has. And second of all, that if Stephen wants, he can join these messengers to go see the Andes in the time that it'll take for the meetings to be arranged with these other local dignitaries. And Stephen is, like, strangely tempted, but wants to wait until after their mission work is complete. I wonder how he's going to how he's going to fare with managing his temptation there. What do you think? I, well, you know, you, you can't have Stephen this close to the high Andes and, you know, pumas and condors and, you know, everything that right, he right, right. longed to see. Um, no, I think Stephen's going to have to contemplate that one. Maybe we should contemplate it. And maybe O'Brien's got some opportunity for some beautiful descriptive writing up in the high Andes. Well, that's something to look forward to when we come back after our break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back from break. I hope you've given some thought to your trip to the high Andes. Yeah. And, and we're back to Jack and the Franklin, in the rolling and pitching Franklin. Out on the ocean, the men are mustering by divisions. This is the first Sunday since his injury that Jack feels like he can reasonably get around the entire ship on his wounded leg. He's he's about to put his dress uniform pants on. Kelly stops him and says, "No, no, no, no! Wait, you know, I gotta I gotta dress that wound first. And you know, O'Brien lets us know the leg, the scalp, they'd healed pretty well. But Killick is reporting here that the eye is still a horrid sight. It now looks like a poached egg, only bloody, he says. And Killick announced that he's going to put some Gregory's drops in with the doctor's drops and salve because, he says, it rectifies the humors. Mm. And, and Jack, you know, who's heard of Gregory's drops before, says, you know, the doctor did not mention that. He was not recommending that. And Killick protests that, you know, hey, I used this on Bondin's great gash, and now that's as clean as a whistle here. Mm. Uh, my, uh, my six former self, my high school senior self, thinks, well, if I've been studying this book in English literature, this is something I, that's been hung out for me to notice here. We get this sense of disgust from the, all the language about Jack's wound, how it looks, the kind of oozy, bloody nature of it. We're meant to go, ugh, I think. And this makes us feel a bit of revulsion, and I think it gives a kind of weakness to Jack. You know, Jack is, is damaged and he's not healing. He's kind of unclean as well. It's, it, it's a, you know, it, it's an unclean wound. Contrast with Bonden, who's on the scene here. His wound is clean. His wound has healed really quickly and... You know, we can see this contrast between Jack and, and Bonden, who is his clean, healed, strong, steady self. Mm, and I wonder what that means for poor old Jack. And anyway, that, that's enough literary criticism. Let's get back to the story. <laughs> well, Jack's wound is ugly and degrading, uh, but nature is neither of those things. The sky and the sea are beautiful, even with the choppy weather. And they have, you know, right in tow there, right on their lee, a new fur trader prize. And the crew is very cheerful knowing that, you know, with, at, at, as they've discussed with the former fur traders on board the Franklin, that their share of this price is reckoned to be 93 pieces of eight. So when, you know, when Jack comes on deck, he does as he always does, examines the sea, the sky, the sails, and he turns his attention to the crew and he can't help, even with his pain, with his anxiety, he can't help but absorb some of their cheerfulness here now at five bells they beat the division and jack and fidel go around the ship and interestingly with bondin accompanying them and he is staying on jack's blind side making sure there's no false step here ah and we learn a little bit more about bondin and his wound 
Ondin's friends have wrapped that gash, you know, a gash that had originally exposed his ribs and his breastbone. They've wrapped it with linen rubbed with hog's lard. They've wrapped it with two different types of sailcloth. They've wrapped it four times around and hauled it so tight that Bondin can only breathe with his stomach. He can't move his chest. It's funny. That it's such a specific description of how Bondin's wound was dressed. That must have been written for sure in some surgeon's log somewhere. Really, really interesting. And I'm going to go back into literary criticism mode. It, it's very striking. Again, we get this contrast between Bondon and Jack. Bondon's friends, his messmates, are there for him. And they literally wrap him up in care. And he's wrapped up with this care and attention, and he's stronger as a result. Jack's particular friend, Stephen, is not on the scene. He's absent. And without the care, without any kind of physical or moral wrapper, despite the attempts of Killick, Jack's wound is festering and, wow. and Jack is weak because his friend's not there. And I, I was really struck by that. I'm still feeling bad for Jack. And it's great that he has Bondon, but it would be even better if he had the kind of care around him that Bondon's been getting here. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I mean, they said, you know, he's got this deep pain in the eye, but he's also got this really festering anxiety. And, and yeah. I can only assume that that's about Stephen Ashore, yeah. you know, in this mission here. Well, the inspection goes really well. Um, especially since Jack has really been confined to his cabin for quite some time. The men have been moved around and Jack goes through and he's quite pleased with it until he realizes when he gets to the wasters that he doesn't know the names of the black men. Oh, you, know, you know, remember these former slaves had been imprisoned yeah. on the ship that they take it as a prize. They all look good. They're in new clean uniforms. They've been taught how to make their salute here. But they also look worried. And and I think, you know, this is Jack. This is Jack the leader, Jack the yeah. captain, Jack the man who's like, you know, I want to ease them up. I should be able to call them by name and know that. Back on the quarter deck with Vidal after the inspection's over, one of the captured officers says to Jack that, you know, he's looking good. And and Jack, you know, speaks to him, thanks him, and you know, looks at this group of assembled captured officers and asks, hey, where is Mr. Dutord? He tells Bondon, hey, run, run down to his cabin, fetch him and bring his servant. And at this point, we have almost by stealth. Right. <laughs> a landing of a big plot reversal of the second half of the book. Right, Mike. This is, where is Dutour? It's not where's Wally, where is Dutour? And I remember reading this and having to rewind in my head, hold on, hold on a second. How long is it since we knew where he was? Right. And we did drop a hint for you, listeners, in the previous chapter, I think, where we said stick a pin in the last known movements of Dutour. It's been very stealthily, craftily hidden by O'Brien. It turns out that neither Dutour, nor his servant, nor his purse can be found, despite searching the Franklin, despite searching the prize and the schooner-rigged launch that's turned behind them been searched actually by men who know how to hide goods from customs officers and the press. So th there's every reason to suppose that if Dutour would would, be, would have been there, he would have been found. Nobody can say when they had seen him last. Nobody can say even if they'd seen him at all since the Franklin had parted company. He hadn't been eating in the gun room. Everybody thought he'd been retired to his cabin, maybe sick. And later on, Jack thinks of all the different times that Dutour could have returned to the surprise or walked aboard the Alastor or aboard the whale when they were alongside. And he remembers, as he has this recollection, that Stephen had said Dutour showing up in Callao might be impolitic. And he has this moment of certainty that this is indeed where Dutour is. And Mike, I, I, many times, many rereadings after I'd seen the Master and Commander movie, I failed to spot what I spotted this time, which is that this is the moment that is represented in the twist at the end of the movie, where in the Russell Crowe movie, uh, the French captain has escaped as the surprise and her prize is part company. Uh, this might even be the last of the Russell Crowe alerts. I, I guess, but I don't know that this is the last time in the canon that we have something that is explicitly uh, edited into the movie. Anyway, at the end of the movie, Jack sets off in pursuit, headed for Valparaiso, not far away from Cayao, actually. Uh, and we have this great line. Mr. Maud, change of course. Southeast by east. We'll intercept the Acheron and we'll escort them into Valparaiso. Aye, sir. Southeast by east. And William? Sir? Beat to quarters. Very good, sir. But, Mike, William Babington's not here. Babington's not available. 
So Jack has to do what he can with the resources on hand. He calls for Vidal, the nipper dog, and asks, who took the launch into Kayao? And Vidal says, well, I did. And his face changes color as he answers. Like he realizes that maybe Vidal has either been sold for a bit of a patsy here or might now be looking like he could have been on the inside of a, of a scheme to get Dutour away. And to Vidal's relief, Jack's question, because Jack's gone into action mode now, he's right into tactical decision-making. He says, right out. So tell me how the launch handled. And Vidal doesn't really understand the question. He's all, I think, befuddled by the idea of his own guilt in this situation here. And Jack says, come on, is, is, is she weatherly? Did she hold a good wind? And Vidal answers that, yes, for sure. She points up close to the wind. She makes almost no leeway. And that's what Jack needed to know. He cuts him off, tells the Vidal, have her victualed and stored with mast stepped before the first dog watch. That's before the kind of late afternoon. He wants a casting net aboard. He wants fishing tackle, since it's going to take them two or three days to beat in with the present wind. And, and another little moment here that we've seen before, I'm thinking all the way back to post-captain and the mutiny aboard the Polycrest when Jack exerted his leadership and straightened out the situation by choosing who goes in the boat. And here he says he'll take Bondon, he'll take Killick, Place, William Johnson, and then after a short pause, he adds, and your Ben. Yeah, your your Ben, Ben Vidal, L- Lieutenant Vidal's esteemed nephew. Ah, <laughs> smart move. Yeah. Not so much a son or a hostage. I think you're fine. Anyhow, <laughs> Jack's become convinced that Vidal had taken Dutour ashore in the schooner. So Vidal was quite right to look guilty, but Jack's not going to pursue that for now because he needs to get some corrective action underway. He understands that Vidal despite his politics, is the best man to leave in charge of the Franklin. He's got experience, he's got respect, he's got a large following, but Jack wants to make sure that he's not going to take any more foolish steps here, so hence putting his boy aboard the launch is is a smart thing to do. He says to Vidal, you're in charge while I'm gone. He gives him directions for coming into port if the wind should change and sets up a series of backup rendezvous. And uh, we're into Jack in action mode, Mike. Like, this could be a turning point for the story here. It really could. You know, it's fascinating to me. And I remember last chapter, I kept thinking, wait a minute, you know, they, they get into port, all of a sudden they're ready to take a surprise. But just when Poings needs these extra men, the launch shows up to take all these men back to the Franklin. And I thought, what did, what did he do that for? Ah, yeah, yeah, there's always method to his madness here. Well, O'Brien tells us that the fore and aft rig launch is perhaps the only thing that might sail successfully into this strong and steady wind. And Jack is Jack is loving it. We know how Jack is with his sailing, you know, into, into a, yeah. a you know rugged seas here. He's trying to get everything out of her. And he's so strongly moved by, I think, you know, the enthusiasm of this boat on this water, but more so by I've got to go get Stephen out of this trouble. I've got to go find Katar. That um, even Killick cowers when he comes to dress his wounds because Jack seems to grow taller and broader here. So, yeah. you know, he was, he was, you know, he was a little bit not so good before. Yeah, this is Jack is back here. They, you know, set up the watches. Uh, they stand first watch, you know, some of the crew and Jack goes down and boom, like always, you know, he's asleep before his head hits the pillow here and he's awake automatically before anybody calls him before midnight here because, uh, you know, he knows it's time for his watch. And with this call to action, Jack goes up on deck and realizes his eye no longer has the deep pain. Mm -hmm. And he's thinking, you know, maybe uh, in the next week or two, I'll be swimming again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, He he takes the tiller from Bondon as the watch changes, and he listens to the men pumping and bailing the launch dry. So apparently this is, you know, we've heard a little bit about this, but this is pretty rugged going for them. Well, suddenly... You know, he's sitting there thinking and thinking about this situation and his intuition. You know, he realizes that intuition that he had when he was talking to Vidal that, you know, hey, I think maybe he helped this guy to try to escape is actually very rational given the similarity between Dutard's and the Nipper Dolling's views. And he's now very glad that he brought Ben along. It's a great moment. We get the connection between this theme of the religious intolerance and the theme of Jack the leader kind of coming back to life. This is a moment where Jack has really turned things around. If he hadn't had that intuition about the 
sectarian issues aboard the boat if he hadn't spotted the Vidal and Ben Vidal thing without that smart people management from Jack the whole thing would have been completely wrecked. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. right. Oh, my gosh. They would have been still offshore. Stephen would have been inshore, unaware that Dutour is on his way to, to, to mess things up. Maybe, maybe this means that Jack's mojo is, is somehow on the way back. Loving that. Yeah. Loving that. Well, you know, Jack knows that the really important thing now is to prevent Dutour from interfering with Stephen's intelligence work. He's seen, we remember the past, he's seen Stephen carrying enough money to subvert an entire government. So I think it's you know, jacked in the back of his mind going, oh my gosh, this is really important stuff. And he had always suspected that Stephen had, in, you know, he's saying it in his mind, dished Ledward and Ray in Pula Prabang. Uh, and then he's, he's kind of reminiscing, he can, he can kind of imagine himself having this conversation with Stephen and Stephen, you know, asking is dish a nautical term? And, you know, Jack explaining that it means to ruin, to frustrate, or even destroy. Ooh, well. Very, very ominous thought there, since they're on the way to find Dutour, um, all the things that Dutour could do to Stephen, given that, you know, Dutour now is going to clearly see that Stephen's the man responsible for his ruin. Oh. Ah. Well, Jack continues to sail the ship even after Johnson comes to spell him. He's just right. on it. And he's kind of watching this phosphorescence on the sea. It's kind of lighting up these many layers of fish below, all feeding and feeding. And he returns to thinking about Stephen's intelligence mission. And he can't imagine that any government, certainly any government in its right mind, would use detour. He says, such a silly, prating fellow as an intelligence agent. Any sort of envoy, he's like, no, couldn't be. And and he's kind of thinking, well, you know, and, and given all that, how in the world is Detroit going to hinder Stephen? Now, he's thinking about this, and as he's thinking about it, this sperm whale surfaces, you know, blows, and, and Jack is just making no progress on solving this riddle. He kind of thinks of this equation with multiple unknown variables. And after Johnson now comes back and you know, Jack allows him to spell him this time, he just says, well, I can't resolve this, but I know it's my clear, evident duty to get Dutard back on board again. If I can't do that, I need to get Stephen off the mainland and yeah. back out of harm's way here. So it's interesting. Jack's thinking that, and then O'Brien tells, tells us that this ship is making virtually no progress in this, even in the failing breeze, but it's a breeze yeah. that's still right in their teeth. In the morning, Jack wakes to a calm, and, and he, like, he usually likes to deliver bad news, you know, and just kind of like tells him it's, it's calm. And, and Jack's kind of surprised. He can smell breakfast cooking. Probably it's way too early for that. And Kelly is dressing his wound and says, you know, well, Joe Place couldn't help but have a cast. We know Joe Place is, is a great aunt with the casting net. Yeah, and, and Jack had called for the casting net to be, exactly. to be stowed aboard the, the launch before they set off. Yeah. Right. And he says that Place wanted to, to go ahead and cook this fish while it's fresh. Jack tells him his eye is feeling a lot better. And Killing says, of course, I knew the Gregory's would do it. It rectifies <laughs> the humors, you know, right? So he says, I'm going to double the dose of Gregory's today. Oh, and no. In fact, I think it's got nothing to do with Gregory's and everything to do with Lucky Jack back and on a mission to save Stephen here. But they go up and they're all eating some of these countless anchovies surrounding the ship. And Jack praises the taste and Place tells him that the fish must die in the pan, otherwise it's poison. And, oh. you know, it's another one of these things. And I thought, you know, O'Brien didn't write that for no reason. No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh. Wow. The, the, the fruit of the sea could poison you. So it, it, it's a really important moment. I, I've really been enjoying, you know, Jack getting stronger, Jack aboard a sailing craft, uh, nice bucolic moments with the crew and anchovies and smell and all this kind of deliciousness. But Jack points toward the southeast and he says to everyone, you, you better fill your belly, he used this phrase, you better blow your kites out and eat all you can because only God knows when they'll have another hot or cold meal. He asks Ben, this is young Ben Vidal, what, if he knows what a wind gall is. And Ben says he's seen the ordinary kind, meaning he thinks he means a gall like a, like a, a, a fruit thing. And Jack says, uh -uh, look away to leeward and he'll see one a long way out of the ordinary. And we don't get very much description from O'Brien about what this looks like, but what we get is the response of the crew. The sailors look at the wind goal, they're very concerned, and they say, God bless us. 
and Amen. And Mike, there's going to be a lot of invoking <laughs> of the Almighty before the end of the chapter. But to help us out, that they obviously know, and they know what the portent of it all is, but what really is a wind goal? Well, you know, it's interesting. It, we, we discover one of these in the 13th and then salute to. And I remember because oh, I, wow. I remember, he, he, remember wait this. a minute, you know, I, I remember I was doing the research on this. And all I could find out is about this horse malady that a wind goal in the nautical definition is this luminous halo on the edge of a distant cloud there. Oh, okay. um, you know, it's it, oftentimes it's where there's rain. It's usually seen in the wind's eye and looked upon as a sure precursor of stormy weather. It's an atmospheric effect of prismatic colors, but it's said to you know indicate bad weather, especially if seen to lure, which is what Jack's saying here. It's all of this has nothing to do with joint irritation in horses, despite <laughs> the chair well, ex except in your mind, Mike. So that's fine. You know, that's valid. But the reader brings or whatever they bring. <sighs> so now the crew know that this wind goal signifies bad weather coming. They spend the forenoon getting the ship ready. By the evening, they're in the midst of this shrieking blast that flattens the sea. There's fine sand and dust gritting their teeth and blowing their sight. And by the way, the fact that there's sand and dust there means that the wind is still blowing offshore. Leading up to the screaming wind, they had just about come abreast of a tall white rock. They saw it just nicking the horizon, just, just like oh, almost within touching distance. They've come so agonizingly close. And Jack at the tiller has all hands leaning far out to windward to balance the boat, as the text says here. The launch tearing through the water at a pace somewhere between nightmare and ecstasy. As they passed under the lee of the island, they heard the sea lions barking and young Ben laughed aloud. You would laugh the other side of your face, young fellow, if you could feel how this goddamn tiller works with the strain, said Jack to himself. Mm. And he noticed that the place was looking very grave indeed and if in seamanship terms joe place and jack aubrey are thinking that we're up against it then it's a right. serious yeah serious situation the sea had been flat the sea now turns ugly there are short waves getting steeper and steeper the boat can't any longer go on under this press of sail and without a word everyone works together to wear ship to bring in the sails and creep out to sea and i've got two quick things about the seamanship side of this here it's absolutely true that uh, you, you can stand a, a huge amount more heavy wind in a, in a flat sea than you can stand when it's chopping up and the boat's really, really pounding. So I, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. What I'm not fine with is the idea of a fore and aft rig launch turning a corner safely by wearing, by presenting it back to the wind. That would be a, a jive rather than a wear. I don't know what ah, that would do. Nice. But never mind. It's He's confusing fore and aft and square rig boat handling, I think, but in a very, very tiny way. It's, it's gutting, though. I mean, they've had to admit defeat. They've had to turn back. And we're thinking, will Jack Aubrey's voyage to South America ever reach any kind of completion? Well, they have turned back. They have had to admit kind of some defeat at this point. And, and you know, at least they've got a little something going for them. They're eating yeah. biscuit and oatmeal mixed together with sugar and water and grog served out by Captain Jack. And Killick, you know, I, you know, every once in a while, Killick comes through. He convinces Jack to let him make a bandage for his eye. He say, he's first, he's telling Jack, you know, we need to go straight back to the ship right now and get you out of this weather. And Jack's like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to do that. We're going to try to ride this thing out. But he says, well, at least let me make you this patch. And you know, this is a, it's a nice moment. To yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier on about the the, the care that Bondon got, and, and Killick's going to get the chance to give that kind of care to Jack here. I, by the way, it's the same. It, it, it's a wrapping bandaging thing that's going on. Listen out for that. Oh. Um, and I love the fact that uh, that Killick evokes Lord Nelson, Jack's hero. And Mike, talk us through the quote. Then at least let me cut a patch out of the flap of your hat, sir, so you can wear the two together like Lord Nelson. You know, tied over your head with a scarf. <laughs> they say, you know, I, I can fix it this if it blows. And O'Brien tells us it blew. You know, the patch was barely on before the making of it would have been impossible. So Killick was prescient here. The boat is thrown about with shocking violence. Jack says, you know, don't worry, it's going to blow out by tomorrow. But it doesn't. O'Brien writes, the days followed one another and the nights, everything on the point of carrying away, a perpetual series of crises, 
Sometimes they advanced until they were in sight of the island guarding Kayal and the cliffs, and sometimes they were beaten back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is really, you know, heartbreaking jeopardy. They've been come so far, and they've got so close. And Jack's strength and leadership has almost got them to where they need to be, but not quite. Um, they were always wet, uh, and they had grown perishingly cold from this wind blowing off the mountaintop. The mountaintops that Stephen had been hankering after are the source of this really bitter, cold, destructive wind. They're also hungry. Ben had scraped his shins badly and lost the oatmeal over the side, so that's not gone well either. On the Thursday, in a familiar moment here, Jack cuts their rations in half and says in this little rhyming couplet that is clearly a bit of grim humour, two upon four of us. Thank God there are no more of us. And as the text says, he was pleased to see an answering smile upon the worn, cruelly tired faces. But there was no smile on Sunday, when at dawn they heard the sea lions quite close at hand and realised that they had been driven back for the seventh time by a wind that was stronger still and even growing, a wind that must have blown the Franklin and her prize far, far into the Western Ocean. End of chapter seven. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we can't get in to shore. We now have no idea where the Franklin and her prize are. Yeah. You know, you were just saying last chapter that, you know, O'Brien had done such a great job of, of actually putting his main characters in jeopardy. And, and here we are again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is real jeopardy. Maybe done a little bit too successfully for my taste. Right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and this, this is jeopardy for Stephen too, right? There's right. this tour loose on shore in Kyle. He, we haven't encountered it yet, but we're sure it's on the way. We've had all these reminders of how harsh the authorities can be, making the Inquisition look mild in comparison. That means if Stephen gets caught, if he's denounced as not Dominova but Maturin, it's going to go badly for him. Yeah. <sighs> right. We've got this crew of, you know, all these philosophy, you know, same as Jatard, Nipper, Darling's equality of men running the Franklin now. Yeah, They've exactly. got a lot of money in their pockets. They've got a very valuable prize at their tail. I'm really glad Jack took Ben with him. I'm kind of wondering, you know, is that enough? And, you know, what good will having taken Ben with him do if they, you know, never get to shore or never get back to the Franklin? Well, I'm, I'm really glad that Tom Pullings has got the surprise in port with Stephen. At least we've got a vessel and a, and a capable skipper available. I still doubt, though, that Stephen's been in much contact with Tom. Um, they seem to be on separate tracks. But who knows where the mission's going to lead Stephen? Yeah, I, you know, every, every chapter, every book, you know, I kept saying, oh, I can't wait to get to South America. Now I'm, I'm sort of saying, be careful what you wish for. Maybe, maybe right now I can't wait to get back out to sea. Well, we're going to have to find out what's going on here. We're getting to the heart of this book, the climax of the book, I think, Mike. What do you say next time, from opposite sides of the Atlantic, to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Ah, uh, with all my heart. <laughs> and said at the Battle of Copenhagen with his telescope to his bad eye. Outtakes? I see no outtakes. <laughs> <laughs>